um, when emotion meets reality, I'm not sure emotion is the right word. I don't really know what the right word would be to describe what's propelling all of this, but I think reality is the appropriate word for the obstacle that it's going to run into. Um, if we go back, uh, we're almost 30 years now since the Rio conference in 1992, which was followed uh, by the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 and the Paris Treaty in 2015. These represent very ambitious uh, government undertakings around the world, an enormous amount of diplomatic effort coupled with a quite significant amount of policy effort in nations around the world. And when we look at the uh, results of all of that work, uh, these are global CO2 emissions from uh, 1750 to the present. And you can see that black line representing the total amount of carbon in the form of CO2 entering the atmosphere. And it's pretty much marched up without interruption since 1950, except for the 1980 recession and a few little notches in there for other recessions. But you would be very hard pressed to um, identify when Kyoto came into force, for instance, by the shape of that graph or, uh, or Rio or the Paris Treaty. Um, the graph just marches up. Um, so that's a, a, a challenge you could uh, put to each other. Um, can you spot the years these treaties came into force? Um, now, another graph that moves at a very steady rate but doesn't seem to change very much in response to policy is the amount of CO2 per unit of GDP. So this is measured uh, on a global scale from 1960 to, the, uh, to 2017. And it's, uh, it's trending in a better direction in the sense that it's the CO2 per unit of GDP. So it means uh, it's driven by improvements in energy efficiency around the world that we, uh, we continue to use fossil energy, but we, uh, uh, we get more efficient at unit using energy. And so the CO2 released per unit of GDP is falling at a steady rate. And again, um, it's not really responsive to policy. So over this time period, there's been quite a bit of policy aimed at um, uh, improving energy efficiency and reducing CO2 emissions, but the underlying trends don't seem to be affected by those initiatives. By contrast, if we look at other types of air pollution, they have responded to policy. So these are uh, graphs showing Canadian data. Uh, the first one on the top there, the emissions of fine particulate matter from 1990 to 2014. Uh, below that, emissions of sulfur oxides from 1990 to 2015. And you can see that Canada, like many other industrialized countries, uh, has dramatically reduced emissions of particulates and sulfur dioxide and also uh, nitrogen oxides, volatile again, organic compounds and other conventional air contaminants. Carbon monoxide would be another one. They've all dropped and in some cases dropped quite dramatically. And that's in response to policy initiatives. So um, we have largely decoupled growth in energy use from growth in most other types of air emissions. And so this is a question that uh, I try to impress on my students uh, when we look at these things, what accounts for the difference? Why is it the conventional air pollutants are going down, but carbon dioxide just continues to grow over time? So here are, I'm gonna spend my time today going over a number of reasons why uh, CO2 is so difficult to reduce. Now, the first one is emissions mix globally. So we're not really interested in one country's emissions. We're interested in the global total. And it also means that unilateral action by one country is largely useless, which leads to uh, leakage problems, as I'll explain. Another issue is the carbon cycle is large and slow. And so the benefits of emission reductions are small and they're postponed until far into the future. If you reduce sulfur dioxide emissions, you'll see a, a a result within a few days. The local sulfur content in the air goes down right away. With CO2, that's not going to be the case because of the size and the slow nature of the global carbon cycle. Third, emissions are closely tied to fossil fuel use, which is essential for economic growth and development. And so we run into 
technological constraints and very steep abatement costs. And the abatement options here are very limited with CO2, unlike the other uh, pollutants that I mentioned earlier. And then finally, when we try to motivate this for the public, we have to confront the question of what exactly are we getting for all these costs that we incur? And what are the damages associated with CO2 emissions? And um, obviously that's an enormous area of debate and disagreement, um, but we can all uh, say uh, that they are highly uncertain. Largely, they're not measurable. They're not measurable directly, and they may not even appear for decades. So I will go through all these five points, beginning here with emissions mix globally. So every country is responsible for a bit. Um, no one country acting on its own could really change total emissions. Maybe China is an exception now because they're such a big player on the CO2 front. But um, with respect to Canada and Ireland um, and much of Europe, um, you could take us out of the picture altogether and you really wouldn't see much of a difference at the global level of, of emissions. And people understand this. So um, we have what's called the leakage problem, which means if one country, if Canada, for instance, cracks down on CO2 emissions, the um, industries involved don't just disappear. In most cases, they just relocate. And so we've seen um, this issue of carbon leakage, <clears throat> meaning the industrial activity just leaves one place where the regulatory environment has become aggressive and unfavorable, and they move to another part of the world where it's, it's uh, more favorable. And you can even get um, <clears throat> a greater than equivalent change in the emissions because if you move from, well, in Ontario, for instance, we have mostly nuclear and hydro, that's where we get electricity from, and a little bit of natural gas. <clears throat> but if a, so if a factory closes in Ontario and moves to China, where most of their electricity comes from coal, it's not a one-for-one one change. There, there's actually a bigger carbon footprint from the same amount of activity if it moves to China. So the leakage issue matters a great deal when we look at the economics of this. If we, if we look at policies and ask, um, what's, what's the emission reduction just within Canada? We might calculate something that's optimistic as far as getting Canadian emissions down. But then when we back up and say, well, what's the emissions implication for the world as a whole? Well, there may not be any emission reduction at all. It may just be the emitting activity moved somewhere else. And there's a big literature on this in economics and leakage rates, depending on circumstances, types of industries, they can vary anywhere from 10% to 130%, at least of the papers I've seen, which means you can pay all the cost of reducing your emissions at home and all that happens is they move somewhere else and they even grow um, beyond uh, where they started from. With the carbon cycle issue, the carbon cycle being large and slow to adjust, the direct implication of that is that when we look at the big policies like Kyoto or the Paris uh, Treaty, they really only just slow down the rate of accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere. And it's partly because they don't cover every country. And even among the countries that are covered like Canada, um, it's only uh, a reduction in the amount of emissions against a base year, but we're not talking about eliminating the emissions altogether. So at the global level, all that's really happening is we're um, bringing about a slight reduction in the growth rate of CO2 in the atmosphere. So in the case of Kyoto, uh, a study many years ago by Tom Wigley, running the uh, one of the um, standard climate simulating systems, simulation systems, said that full compliance with Kyoto means that the concentration of CO2 that we would have reached in the year 2100, we get there in 2105 instead. So for all the costs of a treaty like Kyoto, it, it really just imposes a slight delay in what would otherwise happen. Yet Kyoto, which was had almost too small an effect to even show up in these models was too costly to implement and very few countries complied with it. Canada didn't, um, but we weren't alone in that. Um, most other countries didn't comply. So by the time it expired in 2012, um, it was not 
an, an effective policy. And when we look at Paris, it's the same story that we've got countries making grand promises. And even in, uh, at the Biden climate summit uh, a week or two ago, getting all excited and committing to even deeper emission reductions without being on track even to meet the existing uh, commitment. So here in Canada, um, from 2005 to last year, Canadian greenhouse gas emissions fell by about uh, 1% altogether. But all of that happened in a two-year stretch around the time of the global financial crisis. And since then, they've been growing steadily every year. So um, we're not on track to meet our Paris commitments. Um, <clears throat> this is the study that I mentioned from Tom Wigley. Um, in the bottom panel there, you can see the CO2 concentration in parts per million starting at 350 in the year 1990 and, and going uh, uh, under what was then called the IS92A scenario. And um, by the year 2100, at the right end of the graph, CO2 gets up to about 700 parts per million. The next dotted line underneath that is what happens if everybody who signed up to Kyoto does everything they promised to do, but nothing more. And uh, <clears throat> so under full compliance, we go from uh, without Kyoto to with Kyoto. And since you probably can't see that, I'll, I'll expand it. And uh, that shows you the delay after a century of uh, emission reduction policies in terms of the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere. And then the other lines were other scenarios of what happens if we, everybody does their Kyoto commitment and then we introduce a whole bunch more, uh, even more restrictive policies. And the bottom line there really is all that we get is a, a slight delay in the growth of CO2. And uh, as Bjorn Lomborg has, has shown in uh, his study on the same topic, this time graphing it in terms of temperature change under the RCP 8.5 scenario, which I, I don't recommend anyone use for research purposes, but um, we'll, we'll take it as, as uh, presented here. Uh, the red line at the top is the business as usual. The blue line is what happens if we just do Paris as written. And then the green line is Paris plus anticipated uh, refinements of those commitments for the next 70 years. And at the end of that, um, for all our, our costs and all the problems created, we've purchased about 0.17 degrees reduction in the global average temperature. So these calculations matter because at the end of the day, you have to be able to show people what it is that you are accomplishing with all these policies. And these kinds of graphs are not typically shown to people because they have a very obvious implication, which is um, what exactly is the benefit of this? If, if our choice is do nothing and experience whatever climate change we're going to get or spend a whole bunch of money and then experience all the same climate changes anyway, um, we're better off under the first option. And that brings up another point which um, affects the rhetoric of this issue. So imagine we could measure the costs of global warming if there are no abatement policies. There's obviously lots of problems in trying to do this, but imagine we could. We come up with a number, everybody agrees. Um, this is how much global warming will cost if we don't undertake any abatement policies. That number is not the appropriate measure of the benefits of cutting CO2 emissions. That number may be a starting point, but, um, and people often toss that number out. They'll say, well, you think climate policy is expensive, but global warming is going to cost us $50 trillion over the next 100 years. Okay, well, if that was correct, if that's the true number, what you then need to calculate is what will be the costs if we implement all the policies that you're talking about. And then we get something that looks like this. Those, on the right, those are the costs of global warming if there are abatement policies. So the benefit is that little tiny difference between the two. And in principle, that's a much smaller number, but then also it's a smaller number and it's also um, so much within the bounds of any reasonable estimate of the noise that it um, makes this issue of measuring the benefits of abatement um, very difficult, we'll say. Um, and the, the estimates of, of the size of that number 
are just going to be all over the map and are really going to be um, heavily influenced by minor changes in the assumptions that people make. I'll, I'll come back to that point near the end. Um, but to summarize here, we have to understand the benefit of a climate policy is the discounted value of a slight delay in reaching CO2 doubling or whatever CO2 level you're interested in looking at. All we're ever going to be talking about is the value of a slight delay dated far out in the future. So it's going to be a small number compared to what people have in mind. And anytime you see people talking about using rhetoric like we're going to take action on climate change, we're acting to stop climate change, we're going to tackle climate change, anything like that. Well, that just tells you that they don't understand the scale of the issue and they don't understand what it is the policies are about or what they're supposed to do. Okay, so up to this point, what we've learned is policies need to be implemented on a very large scale just to have a noticeable effect. You have to have full compliance with something like Kyoto and you still only barely can see the effect on the graph. No one's ever proposed or implemented a policy that goes radically beyond that, that would add, actually stop climate change. And up to now, our experience is the policies that have been proposed are A, too small to have an effect, and B, too costly to implement. So our experience with Kyoto, with Paris so far, these policies are too small to have an effect, but they're also too expensive to implement. So then the solution is not to increase the scale of the policies, because we're already into a region where the costs exceed the benefits and increasing the scale of the policies just pushes the costs up faster than the benefits. So we are really in, at least from the economic point of view here, which is the one I'm taking, we're in a world where we can only justify fairly small policy interventions in relation to the scale of the issue itself. Now, why are they so expensive and why is it so difficult? Because emissions are closely tied to economic growth. Um, if we look at the high emission scenarios in the IPCC reports, people often will refer to these and, and talk only about the climate side of it. They'll say, well, under the high emission scenarios, we pump a whole lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. We might get three or four or five degrees warming by 2100, it's a bad outcome. What they don't mention though is those high emission growth scenarios also involve a spectacular increase in global wealth, um, especially in developing countries under the past high end emission scenarios that the IPCC has used, developing countries become almost 70 times wealthier by the end of the century than they are today. That makes them quite a bit wealthier in terms of income uh, than we are today. So, um, the high growth path, um, you get average annual per capita income in real terms of almost $70,000, even in what we call poor countries as of 2100. That solves every development problem known to humanity. That, I guess, the job losses then would be in the foreign aid sector because the be no countries to send foreign aid to anymore. Everybody would be rich. It'd be like if Ireland were sending foreign aid to Canada. Thanks, but we don't need it. We're, we're rich too. Um, at that level of income, every other problem that we talk about has gone away. But we also have warming. Now, in, the cli in climate circles, that's called the worst case outcome. That's the worst case scenario. To me, it, that's not obviously a worst case outcome. Even if we took the warming forecast at face value, and I think for lots of reasons, the warming part of it is overstated. Um, but if, if that was the choice, okay, we have a, a rapid warming of several degrees, but we solve every other problem. Well, um, it is not obvious to me that we should say no to that. I think, and certainly not obvious that that would be our worst case future. Um, now, why is it that I think they're overstated? This is a, uh, a graph that repays a certain amount of close attention. I don't think the authors who put this graph out really uh, appreciated what a remarkable finding it is. 
what this graph shows is <clears throat> on the vertical axis, and I'm sorry it's partly cut off there, but it's the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. The colored lines represent at various intervals in the 70s through to the present, the release of a whole bunch of scenarios of forecasted CO2 concentration levels in the atmosphere. And they're color coded by decade. Um, now, with the exception of that horizontal green line that moves along after the year 2000, that one doesn't really belong in this graph because it wasn't presented as a forecast or even a, a realistic scenario. It was from a paper that was looking at the modeling implications if CO2 in the atmosphere didn't increase after 1988. The others though are presented, especially by the IPCC as their range of forecasts, as their scenarios for the future and what they think the plausible range is. And so in the 1970s, it's the blue lines. In the 1980s, uh, it's the green lines. 1990s, the orange lines. And then there's some after the year 2000 as well. And the striking thing about that graph is the actual CO2 concentration, which is the black line, hugs the bottom end of that range. And at, as each new generation of these projections come out, rather than looking back and seeing Oh, you know, last time we, uh, we overshot. Our, our scenarios were too high. They just put out a new range that still overshoots. So the actual increase in CO2 in the atmosphere um, from the 70s to the present has hugged the bottom end of the forecast range. And that's, um, there's now a literature looking at um, the current scenarios that the IPCC is using. And I... I don't have uh, uh, that information here. It'd be um, an interesting talk just on its own. Uh, they're doing the same thing. Realistic outlooks for CO2 concentrations are at the bottom end of what the current scenario range is that the IPCC is using, just based on the last decade's worth of data. So that on its own, without even getting into issues about climate models or climate sensitivity, uh, the IPCC has a long track record of overestimating the range of likely warming because they overestimate the progress of CO2 accumulation in the atmosphere. Now, on the models, and I know you've had other speakers who address this, um, but <clears throat> on multiple ways of looking at it, the climate models overstate the range of warming. The graph on the left is from Roy Spencer's blog. It's based on work that he and John Christie are doing. The graph on the right is from a paper John Christie and I published last year, comparing warming rates in the global lower troposphere to climate model projections. And you can see the blue line, which is the observations, is down at the bottom end of the range again, after uh, um, the um, interval from 1979 to 2014. And if we, graphed it in terms of the trends, uh, the, ob the observed trends are below all of the model runs. And in most cases, the difference is statistically significant. And this is where the, they're, they're looking at what happened in the past. So this is something that should already have happened. And we've got this persistent pervasive discrepancy here. And um, on other grounds, there's um, there's reason to suspect that the, the sixth generation models, the CMIP six models, are perpetuating this problem of over predicting warming, um, rather than get as a as an ensemble getting back closer to the um, median observations. So for those reasons, I I think going back to that question I raised about is it really a worst case scenario if we have all this economic growth over the next century? I would say. Um, we're on pretty safe ground saying, no, we should prioritize the economic growth. Now, my discussion here is all predicated on the existing abatement technology. And um, that the state of technology is what ties CO2 very closely to fossil fuel use. Um, you have on your cars, no matter where you're watching this from, you have catalytic converters on your tailpipes. And that's a remarkable device that lets you use your car, but emit far less carbon monoxide and NOx and particulates than used to be the case. Um, cars, it's a remarkable story from um, 
1967, I believe, is when the first Mustang was released. And if you had a 67 Mustang and you compared it to this year's model Mustang, you'd have to drive this year's model Mustang about 100 miles to get the same uh, pollution emissions that you'd have gotten in one mile with a 67 Mustang. Uh, improvements in engine and tailpipe technology just means we've largely decoupled motor vehicle use from the urban air quality issues related to cars, especially carbon monoxide. But there are also scrubbers on smokestacks um, that capture or eliminate 95% um, of the sulfur, a uh, similar fraction of particulates. NOx would be lower, maybe 85%, but still um, it's remarkable engineers have been able to come up with, but there are no scrubbers for CO2. Um, there's no catalytic converter that can stop the CO2 from coming out your tailpipe and there are no scrubbers that can, can stop it from coming out of a smokestack. And that's unfortunate. It can be captured, but <clears throat> it's captured in a form that there's, it's, it's still a gas. And so you could try to pump it underground and store it, but that's expensive and not really practical in, in most applications. Um, so that means the only option for cutting CO2 emissions is to cut fuel use. And uh, that's why it begins to cut pretty deeply into economic growth. Um, I want to address just quickly this is issue of energy efficiency. A lot of governments will tell the public something like, we're gonna introduce as a climate policy, strict energy efficiency policies, but don't worry, not only will it, uh, not a, it'll cut emissions, but it'll make you better off because you use less electricity, you'll use less energy. These types of policies are particularly inefficient because first of all, they, they do impose costs, but they're only weakly connected to emissions. Most countries <clears throat> um, have a mix of electricity sources, emitting and non-emitting. So reducing electricity use is only weakly tied to emissions. And then you've got rebound effects. And the rebound effect arises when, if you make it cheaper to use energy, people will use more energy. And so in response to improved energy efficiency, people increase their energy consumption. This is a recent study um, just published back in January in, um, uh, or in, in March in energy economics, looking at the rebound effect for the United States. And uh, in their analysis of it, they concluded that after four years, the rebound effect is about 100%, which means in the long run, no energy is saved. And what it means is um, as energy efficiency improves, people adjust to that by increasing their use of energy to a sufficient extent that there's no energy savings in the end. Now there's a literature on this. This is just the latest. It's not the only paper on the subject, but it all points in the same direction that energy efficiency policies, first of all, they're only weakly related to emissions to begin with. And secondly, they don't even save energy. Okay, so then um, getting to the effects and this gets into the discussion. If somebody asks, as people are entitled to ask, um, why should we even cut CO2 emissions? It's not a regular air pollutant, hasn't been regulated up till now as an air pollutant. It doesn't matter for local air quality. It's obviously a natural part of the atmosphere. Plants like it, it's good for plants. Why are we talking about reducing it? Well, obviously because of the connection to climate, but that's only part of the picture. And, and the other part of the picture, unlike all the other air pollutants that I've mentioned, um, more CO2 in the air, is associated with greening of the earth. And this study, which um, came out in 2016, attributes uh, about 70% of the observed greening trend around the world to the extra CO2 that's in the air. And uh, there's an, uh, a large and, and constantly growing literature. You can see it at co2science.org, uh, which has been there for a long time documenting this. Um, Experimentally and through field studies, um, CO2 enriched air is better for plants and better for agriculture. And um, a typical comeback to that on the climate side these days is to say, well, yes, but you also have to take account of all the warming that's going to happen. And so, well, that then raises the other issue about, okay, how much warming actually will happen. But there are studies that have done that as well. 
And um, I will mention some work uh, in, um, shortly that I did with Kevin Diaratna on this. Um, and we discussed that whole issue, but if you take account of both the temperature and the CO2 change, um, using a reasonable pairing between the two, um, the CO2 benefits greatly outweigh the change from temperature. Uh, this is what the greening of the world looks like um, from that graph. It's a real phenomenon. It's happening around the world and it's driven by CO2. So obviously the uh, concern of CO2 is the climate. One of the issues here as people discuss it is climate is this catch-all term now that covers a lot of imprecise things. And especially anytime there's a bad weather event, people automatically want to tie it to CO2 emissions. Um, so hurricanes, for instance, um, whenever the hurricane season starts up in North America and hurricanes make landfall, instantly a lot of journalists will point to it and say, yeah, well, this is the effect of, of CO2. This is global warming in action. But of course, the data doesn't point to that, nor does the IPCC in, in their various reviews of the subject. They are very reluctant to even identify a trend, let alone say it's driven by uh, CO2. So um, this graph from Ryan Maui from 1980 to the present shows um, the top line is all hurricanes. The bottom line is major hurricanes. Obviously, they move up and down over time. But what you don't see is an indication that um, hurricane global major hurricane frequency is rising over time, let alone attributable to greenhouse gases. Um, and uh, if we measure it in terms of the accumulated energy in tropical cyclones, so not just the count of hurricanes, but the amount of energy as is typically um, added up using um, a parameterization called the accumulated cyclone energy. There again, it's up and down, um, but from the 1970s to the present, um, it's not at historically exceptional levels. As far as flooding goes, this is an area where there's just a world of difference between what the IPCC says and what politicians typically say. So um, in the, uh, their last assessment report on, on the subject, the IPCC just had a brief comment in the United States and Canada during the 20th and in the early 21st century, there is no compelling evidence for climate driven changes in the magnitude or frequency of floods. And uh, I have, um, published on this with John Christie, looking at long-term extreme precipitation data in the United States. Um, you, if you want, you can pick a, a time interval that lets you draw an upward sloping line uh, regarding extreme precipitation. But hydrology data uh, will betray you if you want to play that game because you change the time interval and the appearance of a trend disappears. It's a very complex area of statistics. And um, I'm glad that the IPCC doesn't try to play that game. The US National Climate Assessment did, and that was what John and I focused on in our paper, just showing that if you look at longer or even shorter time intervals, um, their, uh, their claim of an increase in trend in extreme precipitation doesn't hold up. Um, nevertheless, suppose there is a connection. Um, so here's the conceptual problem. Suppose there had been 10% less CO2 emitted in 1963. How would today's weather be different? The proper answer is, it is impossible to say. There is no mortal human being who could tell you. Now, there are people who would presume to be able to tell you. They would run models and they uh, generate counterfactuals and they might try to tell you um, what the difference would be. But I think people just appealing to their common sense would realize that, no, that is not a credible claim to know that. By the same token, if we cut emissions today by 10%, we know there's still going to be hurricanes and floods and all the rest over the next 100 years, droughts, storms, you name it. Um, and who will be in a position to say um, how all those things would have differed in number and timing and intensity over the next hundred years. Um, it's impossible to say it. 
And it's not because we don't have big enough computers. It's just numerically, scientifically impossible to say with any kind of meaningful confidence. And so if we can't identify what the changes are, we can't put a value on them. Now, again, people do. Um, in some ways, uh, we have to, for the, because there are boxes that have to be ticked and numbers have to be put into cost benefit exercises. So you have to put something in there. Um, but we do need to understand that all of these exercises are very speculative and have huge uncertainties around them. And we're only ever making guesses. Um, <coughs> what we could say with some certainty is that um, from everything we know, the, the changes will be small and they'll happen a long time in the future. And that's an important message for people to understand when we talk about the kinds of costs that we're going to incur on climate policy, the effects of the policy will be small and will happen a long time in the future. Okay, um, moving on then to how the costs are actually estimated. Well, I won't go into this. This would be a whole other lecture on its own, but integrated assessment models are the big tools that economists have been using to compute the effects of greenhouse gas abatement um, and we um, put a number on that called uh, the marginal damages of emissions or the social cost of carbon. And that number depends on the equilibrium climate sensitivity, which is taken from climate models and then used in the integrated assessment models. And a few years ago, um, Kevin Diaratna and some other co-authors and me asked, well, what if instead of using the climate model generated uh, climate sensitivity estimates, how about we look at the recent empirical literature and use the empirically estimated climate sensitivity measures instead. So uh, we published two papers on this, one of them in 2017, where we took the um, models that the Environmental Protection Agency had used to calculate the social cost of carbon. And we made one change. All we did was we swapped out their distribution of climate sensitivity parameters taken from the climate models and we substituted in the distribution implied by the work of um, Nick Lewis and Judith Curry from their paper in the Journal of Climate. So we, they're empirically based ECS estimate. And <clears throat> so this was the schedule of social cost of carbon estimates using the EPA models as they were applied by the Obama administration. We make that one change and the social cost of carbon drops quite a bit. It, Essentially, it drops so low that um, it wouldn't even be worth implementing it as a tax. Um, now, I should also point out that that black line itself, as a measure, as an estimate of the social cost of carbon, if you use that as your criteria and you said, "Okay, you're not allowed to implement any policy that has a cost per ton of CO2 abatement above that black line," most of the policies would never be implemented. So it's important to understand that in publishing this paper, we were refining an estimate, but the underlying estimate itself was already pretty low and would have, if it was used properly, it would have ruled out just about all the climate policies we've ever seen. But as I say, if you make that one update to the model using the empirical, empirically based climate sensitivity parameter, you really do end up with a very low estimate of the social cost of carbon. In a follow-on paper that we published last year, um, we additionally changed um, the models by, uh, most of them don't allow for any CO2 fertilization. One of the models does, it's called the fund model, Richard Toll uh, and his team developed it, and they have CO2 fertilization benefits. So all we did was we canvassed the literature over the past 20 years since that model was first set up, and we found evidence that um, the CO2 fertilization effect is probably larger than what was estimated back then. The benefits for agriculture are probably larger. Um, and we went through a, a long battle with the referees over this because especially one referee just was under the impression that no, 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 none of that's true. And uh, warming dominates everything and CO2 effects are small. And we were able to bring out all this evidence from the agricultural literature to say, uh, no, it's the other way around. Um, even with warming, 
and changes in precipitation, the CO2 benefit dominates here. So we just um, added the enhanced CO2 fertilization effect, and I, I don't have it on this graph, but that red line drops down uh, a further few dollars per ton. And um, depending on the discount rate that we use, it's essentially zero, at least out to 2050. So there's no basis then for costly climate policy or even cheap climate policy. So my points today, um, and the question that I set out to answer at the beginning was why has climate policy been so useless over the past 30 years? And the reasons emissions mix globally, so unilateral action is useless, we have a leakage problem. You can knock yourself out um, whatever country you're in, uh, and unfortunately, many countries will do this. Canada is going to do it too. Impose enormous costs unilaterally on itself, and it's not going to stop CO2 emissions from going up. They'll probably just relocate to other parts of the world. Um, carbon cycle itself adjusts very slowly in response, even to large emission changes. So, um, when you ask what does this do to CO2 in the atmosphere? The answer is very little a long time from now. Um, third, emissions are tied to fossil fuel use under current technology. It might change. If somebody comes up with a scrubber for CO2 that's cheap and effective, then this whole issue disappears. It, um, we, we would no longer be fighting over it. It would be like sulfur. We don't really fight over sulfur anymore because it's pretty cheap to cut and bring it close to zero. Um, but we're not in that world. So emissions are tied to fossil fuel use and it's essential for economic growth and development. And the developing world is going to use fossil fuels as they should. And so are we. And um, uh, we can't decouple the two. Abatement options are very limited, as, as I mentioned, there are no scrubbers. Um, there's a bit of you can gain a bit by switching, for instance, from coal to natural gas, but other than that, you have to cut fuel use, and that makes it very costly for a society. And then finally, the, the damages of CO2, leaving aside all the crazy rhetoric on this, the damages are highly uncertain, typically overstated, and are unlikely to appear for decades and would probably be unmeasurable even if we had a good sense of what they were going to be. So that is, um, I think that uh, even though we see a whole lot of discussion now about um, meeting the Paris targets and even going beyond and, and uh, achieving even greater reductions, unless there's dramatic breakthroughs on technology, I think the next decade of climate policy action is going to look like the past decade, which is a lot of talk, but that black line I showed you at the beginning is going to keep going up.